Hello, my dear friend. I'm glad to welcome you here. I would like to invite you to introduce me to one of the works that can help you understand what is power, how is it structured, and how it works. The Prince by Nicol Machiavelli is a classic work of political philosophy, providing a practical guide for rulers. In this book, the author discusses methods of government, strategies for acquiring and maintaining power, and the principles of effective leadership. Combining theory with examples from history, Machiavelli offers readers an in-depth analysis of political processes and approaches to achieving goals in the world of power. The Prince Author Niccolo Machiavelli Summary of the Book Introduction Niccolo Machiavelli, 1469 to 1527, was born in the same year that Lorenzo the Magnificent came to power in Florence. The Medici dynasty patronized the sciences and arts. Machiavelli's compatriots and contemporaries were Leonardo da Vinci and Michelangelo. Nominally, Florence was considered a merchant republic and representatives of the Medici family ruled thanks to their wealth and influence among the people, appointed the right people to key positions, entered into dynastic marriages and military alliances, and placed members of their family on the papal throne. After the death of Lorenzo, a fierce struggle for power began. Using both force and cunning, external enemies made attempts on the city, the regime changed, and the theocracy established by the rebellious preacher Savonarola did not last long. Machiavelli actively participated in all the events of his time as a diplomat, organizer of the army. He was the first in Italy to try to organize conscription service and even as a conspirator. When his party was defeated in his protracted exile, Machiavelli began to write political, philosophical, and also artistic works. His political concept remained relevant even after half a millennium. Contrary to the popular belief that Machiavellianism teaches us to seize power through intrigue and maintain it through cruelty, the author's interest is somewhat different. Having seen enough of the fate of fragmented Italy and the fruits of anarchy, he sought salvation in a strong government and dreamed of unifying the country. Accordingly, the prince raises the question of ways to come to power, especially the annexation of new territories about how to build relationships with subjects old and new, with the nobility, merchants, and common people, about the resources at the disposal of the ruler, especially the army, but also about taxes and the encouragement of trade and crafts, on the creation of a management apparatus, about advisors and flatterers, that is, about the ability to select the closest circle, about the correct distribution of favors and punishments, and the section that turned out to be the most interesting for both contemporaries and later readers about creating an image. In 1559, at the Council of Trent, the works of Machiavelli were included in the list of the most notorious books, prohibited from reading for 300 years, and the further fate of The Prince is bizarre. Despite the ban, French kings read it, and it enjoyed great influence in England, where they did not act. Catholic prohibitions, however, the British considered Niccolo a minion of the devil and gave him the nickname in his honor. Old Nick, the sovereign, acquired the fame of a fatal book even in Russia, where one of the charges against Falinsky executed at the instigation of Byron was the possession of this manual of the conspirators. Some saw in the sovereign the instructions of a tyrant Others a call for republicanism. Some read the strengthening of the law. Others the rules of the mafia. It turned out that the technologies systematized by Machiavelli are suitable for any purpose. And therefore, it was repeatedly proposed even by faithful Catholics to allow at least limited use of this book as a deadly, but sometimes healing poison. But the church remained unshakable. Machiavelli distorted the image of man 
presenting him as susceptible to manipulation and not to the voice of conscience, calling not to be fair and merciful, but only to appear. And the goal that Machiavelli pursued is narrow. Within the city-state, patriotism was also considered contrary to God's plan. He contributed to the division of humanity for the sake of local selfishness. He is truly the enemy of humanity. His book was also read in a completely different way. As a freedom-loving satire, Jean-Jacques Rousseau. As an exposure of the ruler's address to the common people, Antonio Gramsci, founder of the Italian Communist Party. Or as an instruction to patriots again from the common people, Mussolini. Therefore, when analyzing the techniques proposed by Machiavelli and recognizing their benefits, one should remember not only about the poison hidden in this book, but also about the author's quite possible irony, about the minds hidden here. 1. Seizing and Retaining Power States are divided into republics and monarchies. Monarchies, in turn, are divided into inherited and acquired. States can be acquired in whole or in part. That is, a person who has not previously been a ruler establishes his power in this state, or an existing dynasty extends its power to new lands. Acquired states are divided into former republics, where sole power is established, and former monarchies which simply change hands. Ways to acquire power, one's own valor, someone else's weapons, or cunning. The hereditary monarchy is the most stable, since the people are already accustomed to these rulers. The hereditary sovereign has no reason to take harsh measures, and if he does not begin to carry out radical reforms, does not show extreme vices and does not impose additional taxes on the people, then his subjects have no reason to rebel. Such a monarchy can survive even under unfavorable external circumstances. It is more difficult for a new sovereign, including one who has annexed other people's possessions, to retain power. Firstly, in the established regime, they do not think about changes, and a change in power awakens the desire for new changes. Secondly, the new rule raises inflated expectations, and then the new ruler turns out to be worse than the previous ones, because in order to maintain his acquisition, he must deal with dissenters, reward adherents, increase taxes, and coercive measures. King Louis XII of France captured Milan with the support of part of the population, but soon the people rebelled and returned Duke Ludovico. When reconquered after a rebellion, it is easier to assert power, since now the sovereign can oppress and punish unreliable subjects and take security measures in advance. Having captured Milan for the second time, Louis XII retained power until all Italian cities opposed him. This time, the French king used tough measures and carefully monitored manifestations of discontent. Conquered states are divided into two types, those close in language and culture to the conqueror and alien to him. It is easier to keep related territories within the conquering state. You just need to destroy the previous dynasty and promise to preserve the old order. Thus, France annexed Brittany, Burgundy, Normandy, and Gascony. Despite some differences in languages, their customs are close enough to get along peacefully. When conquered territory differs in language and culture, holding it requires luck and clever planning. The best way is to move your capital there then the ruler will know the new country well, protect it from the arbitrariness of officials and bind his subjects to himself, showing concern for them. The Turkish Sultan, having conquered Greece, moved his capital there. The second way, withdraw colonies to new territories or station troops there, a small part of the local population will suffer from the removal of colonies 
whose lands will be taken away. But everyone else will soon calm down, and this example itself will serve as a deterrent. Colonies will bring profit and contribute to the rapprochement of both peoples. Maintaining an army is much more expensive and burdens the entire population, embittering them against the new ruler. The main danger to the new government are the strong and noble. They are the ones who lose the most when a ruler changes. It is important to strictly observe the measure, taming the opposition, and it is safer to exterminate it. For a small evil a person will try to take revenge, but after a big offense, he will no longer have the strength to do so. Prevention is important in maintaining power, not allowing any party to gain strength, and preventing attacks on neighbors. The Romans created an empire by withdrawing colonies, patronizing the weak, and curbing the strong, and protecting the country from external influences. They proceeded from the conviction that war could not be avoided, and delaying it would only play into the hands of the enemy. 2. Types of Management and Relations with Subjects The Roman principle of divide and conquer is well known, but in the end, discord between conquered regions weakens the state as a whole. Strong power manifests itself precisely in establishing order and preventing splits. According to the method of government, monarchies are divided into those where the sovereign places his servants in the highest positions, and those where aristocrats have hereditary access to management. These barons are themselves hereditary sovereigns in their domains. The first type of state is difficult to conquer, but easier to maintain, since the conqueror will not find strong opposition in it. The Turkish people obey only the Sultan. All others are his servants. He appoints and replaces governors at his own will. The king of France, on the contrary, is forced to reckon with the feudal nobility. Parliament serves as a means both to restrain the nobility and to protect it from popular hatred. It is an arbitration institution that curbs the strong and supports the weak without bringing reproaches upon the king. The French king shifts the adoption of unpopular taxes and laws on the recruitment of troops to Parliament and remains in the eyes of the people the protector of the weak. If before the conquest the state was independent and valued its freedom, there are three ways to preserve what was conquered, destroy the state, move the capital there, and maintain the appearance of autonomy, putting local people at the head of the province who will owe this favor to the new sovereign. It is better to destroy the free city and scatter its inhabitants, for they will not forget about their freedom and will rebel even after a hundred years. It is much easier to hold on to a country that is already accustomed to obedience. The most difficult task is replacing old orders with new ones. One has to overcome the hostility of those who benefit from the old order, and even those who would benefit from it do not believe in the new one. Both conquerors and reformers can rely only on their valor. Those who act in the hope of a lucky break, and those who try to win over to their side by persuasion, are doomed. Armed prophets win, becoming sovereigns from private individuals, and founders of empires from rulers of a small country. The new ruler must first destroy strong enemies, gain supporters, create his own reliable army, instill fear and love in the people, improve order, and make friends with other rulers. And a lot depends on whether he has time to do this. The ruler obliged by the rise of his valor acts decisively and cautiously. If power was obtained for money or out of favor, then such a ruler owes too much to those who brought him to power. He did not have time to learn to rule and did not acquire allies. A person brought to power by a happy fate, even if he has valor and cunning, does not always have time to lay solid foundations for such power. Cesare Borgia, with remarkable ambition and cunning, 
created a kingdom for himself in Italy with the support of his father, Pope Alexander VI. But this advantage turned into death, since Cesare was not ready for the sudden death of the Pope. He did not have time to make friends, and he made enemies, and they destroyed him. In addition to valor and the mercy of fate, there is another path to power open to a private person, through crime or thanks to the love of citizens. The Sicilian Agathocles, the son of a potter, rose to the rank of general in the army and carried out a military coup. Soldiers loyal to him exterminated members of the Senate. After that, he happily fought with Carthage, defended and expanded his state. In fact, he too came to power through valor, but criminally. Why do people like Agathocles manage to seize and maintain power through cruelty, while in other cases repression turns out to be useless? Cruelty must be applied urgently and for the sake of safety, not increasing, but weakening repression over time. Having dealt with those who cannot be won to his side at once, the sovereign gives the rest time to gain courage, then shows them favors and wins them over to his side. If those who previously considered themselves safe begin to be insulted, they will never be a reliable support for the ruler and will rebel at the slightest opportunity. In republics, the nobility is opposed to the people, and the struggle of these two principles leads either to anarchy or to freedom or to autocracy. Both the nobility and the people nominate their leaders. It is more difficult for a protege of the nobility to remain in power because the nobility considers itself equal to him. The protege of the people, on the contrary, is surrounded by those who want to obey, and besides, the demands of the people, for example, deliverance from oppression, are easier to satisfy than the insatiability of the nobility. Among the nobility, three types of people should be distinguished. Those who are ready to support the sovereign, those who do not support him only out of lethargy and cowardice, and those who oppose him out of ambition. The first should be distinguished by favors, the second can be used, especially by specialists, and the ambitious should beware. Even if the ruler was brought to power by the nobility, he will ensure the favor of the people by taking them under their protection and the people will be even more disposed towards the sovereign than if they themselves had brought him to power because they will be glad of unexpected mercies. Without gaining the favor of the people, the tyrant will be overthrown. The favor of the people is the surest way to prevent conspiracies. Nabis, the ruler of Sparta, withstood the onslaught of both other Greek cities and the Romans because he eliminated several ill-wishers in time. The people do not always serve as faithful support to those tribunes who speak on their behalf and seek protection from them from enemies or the government. But a ruler who does not ask, but demands, especially if he mobilizes the people for war, will find support in him. It is necessary to accustom the people to such loyalty in advance. Citizens must need the sovereign and the state. This is the only way to rely on their loyalty. 3. The army as a stronghold of the state. Caring for the army is the main responsibility of the sovereign. With the help of the army, they maintain power and those who are not born on the throne come to power and those who possess it retain power. Francesco Sforza seized power by force of arms. His children lost power because they avoided war. The state either has enough people and money to equip an army or can only defend itself under the protection of city walls. In the second case, you should strengthen the city and treat your subjects well. This will make it difficult for enemies to attack. Small German cities maintained their independence thanks to strong walls, artillery, and an annual supply of provisions. Military affairs were also encouraged there, and the freedom of citizens was welcomed. 
The basis of power is good laws and a good army. But without a good army, there are no good laws. And where the army is good, there are good laws. Troops can be your own allied, hired, and mixed. Mercenary and allied that is. Foreign troops are unreliable and even dangerous. They fight poorly, irritate the population, and can turn into enemies at any moment. Cowardly mercenaries will lose the battle. Brave ones will seize power themselves. Only sovereigns at the head of their army or a commander appointed by the Republic achieve success. Armed and free, Rome, Sparta, Switzerland. Carthage was almost destroyed by its own mercenaries. The Thebans' freedom ended when they recruited Philip of Macedon as an ally. Weak states are looking for allies, but the allied troops serve their sovereign and not the one they came to help. Anyone who calls an allied army is doomed to dependence. An allied army is more dangerous than even a mercenary one because behind it stands the power of an entire state. The enslavement of Greece by the Turkish Sultan began with the fact that the Byzantine Emperor asked the Turks to help him in disputes with his neighbors. Also, with the advent of barbarian mercenaries, the decline of the Roman Empire began. A typical mistake is to seek help from the powerful. A strong ally soon turns into a competitor and enemy. It is necessary to maintain a system of counterbalances and not finish off the enemy if the strongest comes to the vacated place. And one should not show indecisiveness, but come to the benefit of the weakest, having thus secured an ally and weakened a potential enemy. The French King Louis, during the conquest of Lombardy, turned to the Pope and the Spanish king. Having expelled the petty rulers, he contributed to the strengthening of the strong ones, invited foreigners to the country, and he himself did not establish either a capital or a colony here. The fatal mistake was the defeat of Venice. The cities of Italy would not have dared to fight France as long as there was a threat from Venice. Sovereigns should temper their bodies, perform military exercises, study various areas with the idea of how it is more convenient to fight here, and also read historical works in search of role models. Such preparation in peacetime will pay off in times of war. Wise rulers always prefer their own army. It is better to lose with your own people than to win with others. The biblical hero David, going into battle against Goliath, refused the royal armor, preferring his sling. Someone else's army, like someone else's armor, is always too much for the shoulder or the hand. The attitude of the sovereign to the people and army depends on the origin of his power. When new territories are conquered, the entire population should be disarmed, with the exception of those who went over to the side of the conqueror, but they should also be gradually weakened and removed so that only old citizens remain in the army. If this is a new sovereign brought to power by the will of the people, he, on the contrary, arms part of the population in order to express confidence in the people and increase his army. The basis of power is victory. Sometimes it makes sense to create enemies for yourself who can be easily defeated and thereby gain the respect of the people. Unexpected and even cruel actions also inspire respect if you find a plausible excuse. Ferdinand of Aragon became from a provincial prince, the king of all Spain and the most glorious ruler of the West, acting under the pretext of defending the faith. He captured Granada, expelled the Jews and the descendants of the Moors from the country, then campaigned in North Africa, Italy and France. He kept his subjects in such tension that they, carried away by events, would not have time to hatch a conspiracy. 4. Virtues of the Sovereign, Reality and Image The advantages and disadvantages of a person who stands above others are striking dot dot and a one can combine all the virtues 
and therefore one must avoid those vices that lead to defeat or loss of power, and at least show moderation in the rest. Moreover, many virtues only cause harm, while other disapproving traits provide security. Generosity is usually expected from a ruler, but having spent money on magnificent shows and benefited a few, he will be forced to refuse those who are accustomed to handouts and even burden the people with taxes. It makes sense to show generosity only on the way to power or during a military campaign, giving trophies to the army, but the property of your subjects must be protected so as not to arouse hatred in them. Julius Caesar was generous to his army and also spent money on bribing influential Romans and appeasing the people. But when he came to power, he began to cut expenses. Sovereigns prefer love rather than fear and strive to be known as merciful, but sometimes cruelty is merciful if executions or reprisals against a rebellious city are needed to stop and rest, then these punitive measures are more merciful than the anarchy from which the entire people suffers. Many people want to be both feared and loved, but since love is not compatible with fear, it is better to choose fear, but fear without hatred. People are ungrateful and do not remember good things. In need they will turn away from the sovereign but fear will not allow them to rebel or change. In order not to cause hatred, one should refrain from attacking property and women. Having an obvious reason, you can even execute the culprit, but people forgive the execution of parents more easily than disinheritance. Reasons for confiscation of property are found more often than for execution, and as a result, the sovereign and officials become accustomed to predation. A sovereign at the head of a strong army can afford reckless cruelty, and besides, an army of different tribes can only be restrained by cruelty. Hannibal would not have achieved the highest glory if he had not been so cruel, and Scipio was removed from command for being too soft. The absolute dignity of a sovereign is considered to be loyalty to his word. However, cunning people succeed much more often than honest ones. The sovereign must be like a lion and a fox, that is, instill fear in his enemies and break his word if this is in his interests. And moreover, it is necessary to give deception the appearance of decency. One must be able to appear and, if possible, be merciful, generous, honest, but, if necessary, also demonstrate the opposite qualities. The sovereign must strengthen his reputation as a decisive, wise, and consistent person. He must be the patron of talent, ensure the safety of trade and agriculture, organize festivals and shows, and respect traditional guilds or other associations. The intelligence of a sovereign is judged by his advisors the sovereign must understand enough about people to attract smart and loyal people and avoid flatterers. The basic principle of good government is to please the people without embittering the nobility. The sovereign must delegate matters that are displeasing to the people to others. The Roman emperors were also forced to please the army, and therefore some died, incurring the hatred of the people with cruelty and others, incurring the contempt of the army with meekness. Conclusion The Prince was written, in fact, as a candidate's program. Machiavelli hoped that the Medici, newly established in Florence, would call him to serve, and was in a hurry to show the full range of his practical knowledge. This brief guide was accompanied by a huge historical essay discourse on the first decade of Titus Livy, a treatise on the art of war, several works on the topic of the day on how to deal with the inhabitants of conquered cities, using the example of the actions of the same Cesare Borgia. The Medici preferred their traditional methods and did not turn to Machiavelli. He survived this dynasty, was nevertheless called upon by the briefly established Republic to train a militia, and it immediately became clear 
that in fact he had little understanding of the art of war. An attempt to get to the highest elected position also ended in failure. Niccolo never got political power. He gained power over minds after his death. Compatriots and contemporaries read his books as a call and a direct indication of the path to the liberation and unification of Italy. For the sake of this good goal, he was ready not only to endure, but also to nurture the tyrant and poisoner Cesare Borgia and offer his methods as a role model. The end justifies the means is a phrase attributed to Machiavelli, although perhaps incorrectly. In his case, something more surprising happened. The means became divorced from the ends. Machiavelli's methods were of great interest to those who did not have the slightest interest in restoring Italy. The reasoning of this purely civilian and private man was studied with confidence by the commanders and founders of empires Frederick and Napoleon. His book was studied by another Medici, the French Queen Catherine, the inspirer of Stee-T. Bartholomew's Night, read by tyrants unsure of their power and their successful overthrowers. A book that has been banned acquires a romantic aura. The overwhelming majority of Europeans have not read The Prince for 300 years, but only heard that such and such famous villains read it. And, of course, this is where they got their villainy from. When the book returned, it was first and foremost the author's compatriots who accepted it again and saw in it something like a reference book for a revolutionary and organizer. In a striking way, it is simultaneously raised to the shield by Italian fascists, communists, and mafiosi. Each century reveals classic books in its own way. In the 20th century, Machiavelli coincided with the central theme of the strong personality, the cult of the hero, who at the same time must be flesh of the crowd, people, or family in its mafia sense. And therefore, the new popularity again turned into rejection. Machiavelli is no longer suspicious not only as the inspirer of Borgia and the religious executioners, but also as Mussolini's favorite author. What do we subtract from the prince in the 21st century? Whatever it is, here's a reminder that might come in handy. Machiavelli was a weak man. In many respects, he was weak. He did not possess titanic willpower, was cowardly, subject to attacks of envy and bile, did not receive a university education, did not shine with talent, and did not make a significant career. Among the geniuses of the Renaissance, he is the unlucky little brother. And partly perhaps this, and the end of a great era, was inspired by his not very humane instructions, his misanthropic philosophy. But if we accept our weakness and the end of an era as an ordinary human lot, this book will find its place in the urgent search for man's place in the universe. Dear friend, thank you for still being here. And since that's the case, I want to remember that any object and situation can be looked at in different ways. According to the principle, the glass is half full and half empty, so take the best for yourself and use it. Bye.